So in yesterday's class, we had a chance to look at a broad overview of separation processes and their importance. And hopefully you got the idea that separators are all around you. They're in, everywhere in your home and in your body, you have several separation type units that are helping your body function. We then ended off the class yesterday by looking at that matrix on the board. There was that three rows, three columns, looking at how you can classify separations based on which phases are being separated from each other. So solids from liquids from gases. And we also made the important distinction in yesterday's class that fluid, when we use the term fluid, it means either a, sol uh, either a liquid or a gas. It can be re uh, referred to by that term. And then I wanted to end off the class yesterday, but I ran out of time and wanted to talk about this topic of separating agents. <clears throat> Separations don't occur by themselves. The second law of thermodynamics prevents that idea from happening. We always have either a mass being added to our system or energy being added to our system, and in some cases both. So you have to add either a mass separating agent or an energy separating agent to create that separation or to assist that separation to occur. So if you're adding heat to a system, for example, to boil water, to evaporate it off, that's clearly an energy separating agent being added. If you have to add a liquid solvent, that's extra mass being added to the system, that's a mass separating agent. If you're adding pressure, such as in a filtration device, you've, you're pushing to get material to move through the filtration medium, the pressure that you're adding is an energy separating agent, but that filter medium, that piece of paper cloth or rubber or some device that's retaining the solids, what is that? An ESA or an MSA? It's a mass separating agent. So you have to add some sort of device to create that separation. What is vacuum? Vacuum is just the opposite of pressure, so it's an ESA. A membrane, MSA. Okay, filter media, we've covered an electric field. We'll see an example of that today. It's an ESA. Temperature gradient, energy, gravitational field. It's an ESA, it's an energy separating agent. You have to create a gravitational field, either you get it for free because you're here on Earth, or you have to create it artificially in a centrifuge. So you have to rotate that centrifuge really fast to get an artificial gravitational field set up. An adsorbent, AD. An AB, absorbent, both of those are mass separating agents. So it's fairly easy to distinguish between what's an energy and a mass separating agent. You'll always know uh, what's, what's there, but the key is you have to apply one or both of them to get your separation to occur. We also have to introduce this new term of a separation factor. So whenever I introduce new terminology, I'll show it there in a different color in my slides, um, in that color over there. So separation factor is a number that can be used in any separator to quantify how well you've separated. And it's defined quite simply as the two streams leaving. We don't really care what's coming in because remember a separator can take multiple streams. When it, we're dealing with separations, we're only concerned with what's leaving and the relative purity of those two streams. So we can quantify that using X <coughs> terms. And X, those X's can either be mass fractions or mole fractions. It doesn't really matter because the units will cancel out in that <coughs> equation over there. So whether you use mass or mole fractions or, or flows, even just flow rates would also work as long as you're consistent. One refers to one of the streams leaving and two refers to the other stream leaving. Again, it doesn't matter that it's physically at the top of the device or at the bottom of the device. It really is just a labeling. And then I and J are chosen as the two species that you're separating from each other. Okay. So if you're separating water from sand, for example. You'd pick water to be I and sand to be J. And what you have to do though, the only requirement you have to do is when you create that selection of what you assign to I and J, is you assign them so that you get a value that's greater than one. 
Sij, that separation factor, the smallest value it can take on is 1. Okay, so you have to create i and j so that Sij is above 1. If you get an Sij less than 1, you just need to flip the order of what's i and what's j around, and then you'll get a value greater than 1. Okay, so let's, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's and, and the i and j is also, if you're separating multiple products from each other, it would be you create separation factors for each combination of, of the materials being separated, okay? So let's, uh, let's start simply. We'll, we'll get, get some practice. This, um, by the way, wasn't in your slides that you've downloaded. I see a lot of you writing down stuff. You really shouldn't be. Um, you should just be printing the notes off the website. I don't want you to be spending your time copying incorrectly what's on the slides down on your paper. Simply print those notes, bring them to class, but this is one that you don't have in your notes. You don't really need it because it's a case study and I want you to think about this. So here's a, here's a cyclone. We'll look, get to this two, three weeks from now. A cyclone has your feed coming in over there. Uh, this is at a sawmill. So your feed coming in and it's being spun around your material. You can see inside there. We'll look at those diagrams in detail later on. But there's two streams leaving, your overhead stream and your underflow stream. Your underflow stream is mostly solids, and in this case, it's 60% solids, 40% fluid. That fluid could either be air or water, depending on what you're separating here. In this particular example, our fluid is, the, is air. Up at the top, we have 99% fluid and 1% dust. So we're trying to separate dust from that incoming mixture. Calculate the separation factor. Got a minute. You should be able to do this really quickly. I need to see calculators. I need to see writing. We need to get some numbers here. Anyone got a value less than 1 by mistake? Okay, if you get a value less than 1, just flip your i's and j's around. So if we assign I as my fluid phase and J as dust, that's one option. We could look at 1 as being assigned as the stream leaving up at the top. So if we've got my cyclone here, that's stream 1 and that's stream 2. Subbing into that formula Xi1, what is the value for Xi1? What's this entry over here? So 99 over 1% of dust. So xj1, j is dust, leaving in the first stream at the overhead. The denominator is equal to 60 over 40. And you get a separation factor of... 40 over 60? Yep. Okay, what's your separation factor then? Forty-eight? 148. Yep. Okay. 
let's say you tweak that cyclone and you get 99.5% at the top and 0.5% dust. And let's leave the bottom roughly at 6040. It might change a little bit, but not too, too different. So now instead it's 99.5 and 0 0.5 at the bottom. Okay, so what's your separation factor now? 298. Okay, so separation factor's gone up. Okay, so what we've learned here is that higher separation factors are better. You want a separation factor higher and higher. What does a separation factor of 1 mean? If you get a separation factor of 1, what is that telling you? You haven't done anything. You've just mixed stuff around, okay? And what's leaving in stream one at the top and leaving in stream two at the bottom is exactly in the same ratio. So the stream one ratio and the stream two ratios are identical. You've really not caused any separation. What happens if you get a separator that has 100% fluid at the top and no dust? What's SIJ? It's infinity. Okay, so right there you've, got, you've established for yourself two bounds. Your, your worst separation is a separation factor of one. Your best possible separation factor is infinity. Okay, and you're somewhere in between of those. Okay, so this is what you're going to use to judge whether you've made a significant change to your process. Your boss is asking you to go fix up that cyclone to get better separation. You can tweak things all you like. But this is the number you're going to look at at the end to see whether you've made an improvement. Okay? You will also have constraints, for example. You might be, a, by, might be by law restricted to putting no more than 0.5% dust up into the air and spreading that around your neighbors. Okay? So you, as long as you're retaining that, but the way you're going to tell as an engineer whether you've improved the process is by looking at SIJ, its separation factor. Okay, everyone clear on that one, that number? We're going to keep referring to that one over and over. Okay, so that was a bit, a bit of a wrap-up from last class. So let's get right into this topic now of mechanical separations. A cyclone is one form of mechanical separator. These are generally fairly easy to understand. They're based on physical principles that you're very comfortable with. We will simply pull in those physics concepts from first year, you'll see a lot of fluid flow principles coming in from your second year courses. The reason why I want to study these is because you'll see these in most processes. They're very reliable, companies use them frequently, and we should have a broad overview of mechanical separation. Some things like gravity, which we're going to see here in today's class, gravity is, is probably one of the only freely available energy separating agents to us. Okay, so we like to exploit gravity because we don't pay any money for it. So that's a good mechanical separator and it's a good place to start with. So let's take a look at them. We're going to start with this topic of sedimentation and then screening. And then when we get to a point where we say, well, look, gravity isn't really good enough anymore. Gravity doesn't provide enough force to separate for us or doesn't separate fast enough. We're going to then go into centrifuges and cyclones and we're going to speed up things a little bit. Okay? And then filtration is another form of separation that also applies an energy separation, separating agent and a mass separating agent. But there's two others that I quickly want to touch on. Uh, in fact, magnetic separation was one that, uh, that I saw uh, two people ask to cover in those papers on Friday. Magnetic separations are really important. We see these a lot in the food processing industry and in the drug industry. There's, I'll post a link on the course website. Um, so I showed you that video yesterday, how to make sugar. That comes from a series of videos of how to make most everyday products. And there's one that's how to make bacon. And in that video, you'll see a magnetic separator to make sure that no metal goes into the food that's then consumed by people. In the pharmaceutical industry, we don't want small pieces of metal being ingested by our customers. Uh, we'd like to... Uh, prevent that and so we use magnetic separators by 
using them along a conveyor and then that, 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 that drum over there is charged and it simply retains the particle, the magnetic particle, for a greater period of time than it retains the non-magnetic uh, material. So simply by momentum, the non-magnetic material will, will keep going and the magnetic material will be retained for slightly longer and be separated. So it's a very simple process and you scale it up simply by making that, that belt wider or narrower. So depending on your throughput that you need, you go to a wider belt or a narrow belt. So it's fairly straightforward and these are off-the-shelf units that you can purchase from, from a variety of companies. Okay. It's also very, um, you might be interested in this principle of where you're throwing one material a little bit further than another material is exactly how diamonds are separated from sand. So diamond appears very naturally in the Earth's crust. The last thing a company wants to do is when they're mining diamonds is to be crushing that sand. Right? So that's clear. So you don't want to be crushing that sand, but you do want to extract the diamond from the sand. So most of the world's diamonds actually occur in the ocean. Um, they're not, we've kind of exploited most of the land-based diamond mines, but the ocean diamonds are still prevalent. So big ships just dredge, uh, dredge pieces of, of soil, pull it up onto the ship, and they're simply using this principle where diamond has a greater density than the other material to throw it a little bit further and they separate it out that way. Okay, so you can read up a little bit about that if you're interested on these sort of gravitational based separators or exploiting density differences really. Another one is electrostatic um, separators, similar principle exploiting the difference in conductivity of materials rather than their magnetic properties. Okay, so a charge is set up on the surface of that material and same idea is being used. Okay, so let's look now at sedimentation. Sedimentation is we're exploiting gravity and you saw that a bit in the video yesterday. You can go play that sugar uh, video back and at around that time point, 4.35, you'll see this. This is just a screenshot from it uh, where the material on the left here is mostly separated and there the material on the right is starting to separate through sedimentation. And there's that interface between the separated material and the sludge settling down in the bottom. Um, have any of you done that lab where you, 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 you watch the stuff settle? Yeah, you've, some of you have done the civil engineering lab where that happens. Okay, so you can also go try this yourself at home. I can't do it in this classroom anymore, but in, in a prior class I demonstrated this. Uh, if you have concrete powder lying around from any of your home renovations or your parents' renovations or even just drywall compound, mix that up in water and you can watch it um, settle out. Or uh, add vinegar to milk. It doesn't work quite so, so well as the, the other two, but if you make that milk curdle, you can see the curds separating out that way. So we're simply using gravity to do that work for us. Now, what we will do use here, and for those of you that work in the wastewater treatment areas after this, uh, you'll see three words that are related to this area, thickening, clarification, and dewatering. And now thickening and clarification are two types of sedimentation where we're removing these solids from the fluid. Thickening simply aims to increase that solids concentration to a higher level. So we want a higher solids concentration and generally these processes are done at higher throughput. Clarification is exactly what it says where you're trying to clarify that liquid a little bit f further by removing the last bit of solids. But the key distinction here is when you're clarifying is that your feed is relatively dilute with solids. It's mostly fluid, little solids. And then once you've, once you've separated those materials or you've, you've thickened your materials, that solid waste coming out the bottom of the thickener uh, it's, not, it's not a type of sedimentation, but it's a term that's related to this. You'll always see this on the same flow sheet. You'll see a dewatering step. A dewatering step takes those solids now and tries to remove the last bit of water from them. Okay, so your typical wastewater treatment flow sheet will have thickeners, then clarifiers, and the solids from the, from the thickeners will then go to dewatering to try and remove the last bit of water. Quite clearly, we, want, we don't want to, that solid material from a wastewater treatment process has to be put somewhere. Right? We can use it as fertilizer, or we can burn it, but what we do want to 
do first is remove as much water from it first as possible to reduce the weight of material that we have to deal with. Okay, so I thought I'd just uh, throw those words out there for those of you that won't ever deal with wastewater treatment, but these are good terms to know about. Yes. Okay, so coagulation is, uh, is a term we're going to see probably two classes from now. And we'll look at that in some detail. Now, the places where this is used is not just municipal water treatment. Uh, so don't just think the standard municipal wastewater treatment flow sheet when you see and talk about sedimentation. Sedimentation is used even by food companies, and mineral process companies. So any company that's dealing with a large quantity of water will have to deal with that water before they can dispose of it into the municipal system. So oil sands treatment, their water is, has to be cleaned up first before they can dispose of it or re reuse it again. Um, the food processing industry, so I, has, I was lucky enough to do a co-op term at Coca-Cola in Swaziland uh, many years ago and over there the company deals with sugary liquid waste, but cannot dispose it of it into the municipal system. It's very high level of sugar will just uh, cause, cause trouble downstream in the municipal waste water treatment process. So they first treat their water before they dispose of it through sedimentation. Okay, so sedimentation is widely used in a variety of areas over there. Now, I'd like you to well, okay, before I get to that, let's just take a look at where we're going to go with the section. We're going to look at, in today's class, what, how we can speed up sedimentation and what factors influence it. And then in the next class, we'll look at some of the design and the costs related to it, and then coagulation, as I mentioned there earlier. So let's think of it this way. I'd like you to take a second, and on this slide, if you've got it printed out, or the next slide, um, consider a particle. So for our purposes, we're going to consider our particles to be spherical. It's not a bad choice initially. I'll show you how we can vary up that decision later on. But let's take a look at that particle and what factors, brainstorm a few factors with the person around you or on your own, if you're more comfortable that way, that will affect how fast that particle will settle. So what is going to affect the sedimentation velocity or the sedimentation rate? There's the first one, the diameter of the particles. Anything else that you can think of? So write down those on a piece of paper. Hey, Chris, just be careful if you're sitting here. Too. Okay. Yeah, it didn't bump, so it's okay. Yeah. Okay, what sort of, what, what aspects of that environment are going to be important? We've got the, the diameter of this particle, the mass of the particle, anything else? Devin? Viscosity of the fluid around it. So, so this particle is surrounded by fluid. Let's consider that board to be the fluid around it, the viscosity of that. The roughness of the particle, okay, it's a good one. Anything else? Yeah. Porosity. Porosity of the particle, okay. The polarity of the particle. Polarity of the particle. Density. 
of, of the fluid. So density of the fluid. Yes. The pH. Sean? The velocity of the fluid. Yeah. Any other factors? Dissolved acid. Dissolved acid, so, gases. oh, gases. <coughs> Gravity. Gravity itself, yeah. The temperature of the fluid, or, yeah. What is temperature of the fluid going to affect viscosity, okay? So temperature of the fluid will indirectly have an effect through there, right? Okay, so lots of things that can potentially affect that particle settling rate. A lot of you have gone into a lot of detail over here. Okay, made it very, thinking very complex type interfacial phenomena occurring over there, and that's, that's quite okay. Let's take a look at um, just uh, one other point here. I think we've got them all, strength of the gravitational field, the density of the particle versus the fluid. So we've got the density of the fluid. The other one is the density of the particle itself. Okay, viscosity of the fluid, the particle concentration. So right now I've drawn one particle over here, but if there's many other particles around it, that's going to affect the speed of that particle settling. One thing to, to bear in mind is the diameter in which we're settling this material in. If the diameter of my vessel was the size of this entire board, would it affect the settling velocity relative to the case where the diameter was maybe this much between the distance between those two green lines. Would you get a faster settling rate if the distance was this much versus this entire board? Would the particle's settling rate be affected? Probably not too much, right? But if I start to bring in that diameter to maybe this, this distance, then I'm certainly going to start to affect it because as this particle is falling, it's displacing fluid, which is then having to move up around it. But if the diameter of the vessel is really large, there's to a point, the diameter of the vessel really has no effect on the rate of the particle settling. Okay? So we'll, we'll come back to that subtlety a little bit later. These terms here, the roughness, the polarity, the pH, dissolved gases, they may have an effect on the particle's settling velocity, but not appreciable. Right? Not too appreciable. The main effects on a particle, let's think of this from a physics perspective, what are the forces that affect that particle and the directions of those forces? There's a buoyancy force going up. Devin? There's a drag force. Okay, which direction is the drag force? Up? Okay, other forces on the particle? Gravity. Gravity. What is the gravity force related to? Mass of the particle, g, the gravitational constant. Anything else? What's the proportional, what's the, that term going to be equal to in a mathematical equation? Okay, so back to first year physics. <laughs> So gravity, a constant downward force is m times g, the mass of the particle, times the gravitational. Or another way of stating that is the volume of the particle times its density, rho p, 
times g. Okay, so there's your gravitational force. Buoyancy force is proportional to the volume of fluid displaced. So while gravitational force is proportional to that particle over there, the buoyancy is proportional to the volume of fluid displaced multiplied by rho f. Okay, so it's the rho f appears in the buoyancy force, whereas rho p, the particle's density, appears in the gravitational force. And then drag opposes the particle's motion in the upward direction, as, as Devin mentioned, and we'll take a look at that on the next slide. There are some other forces that might affect this particle, which we're going to discount for now. Brownian motion and some of these other minor chemical interaction forces that were mentioned. So any sort of gases bumping into that particle, dissolved gases, effects due to pH, polarity, and surface roughness, we're going to discount that for now. They're relatively minor. You're not going to make a mistake by dropping those off. Certainly not, to, not for the use that we're, we're using this for. Okay, any questions up to this point? Okay, let's go do a momentum balance on this. And we need one more term, though, to do the momentum balance. We need a term for the drag force. So F drag is given by a drag coefficient CD times the area of the particle, and that is AP, is the projected area of the particle. Let me quickly explain that um, to you in this way. If I took the particle over here and I shone a flashlight onto that particle, so here's my flashlight, I'm shining the particle, I'm going to get a projected picture of that particle on the other side. That projected picture refers to AP. That's that area over there given by a diameter of the particle dp. Okay. It is not, some, some people might consider that the projected area of the particle is this sort of surface area underneath the particle. That's not what we're referring to. It's the, it's the area that the fluid sees coming from the particle falling down. Okay. So it's that area looking up at this particle falling down at you, you're seeing that projected area AP. Okay, So that's a standard formula for the drag coefficient. The only other term we need to be mindful of in there is the velocity term. The velocity term refers to the relative velocity between the particle and the fluid. Consider the following. If that particle is falling down with the velocity of V, VP going down, but the fluid that it is suspended in has a velocity upwards of Vf. If the fluid's velocity matches the particle's velocity, that particle will stay exactly static. Okay. And that is the principle of elutriation. So if you've heard the term elutriation, all elutriation does is it moves liquid up at a certain velocity, and particles which are small get carried up with the fluid, and particles which are heavier, sorry, are, have a lower terminal velocity, will settle down. Okay? And particles that are exactly at the right shape will stay static. So elutriation is a way to separate particles by exploiting an upward fluid velocity and matching it with the downward terminal settling velocity of the particle. Okay, so it's very important to realize, though, that the drag force is proportional to the relative velocity because if Vf matches Vp, that particle isn't really moving. It's static in that frame of reference, and so there's no drag on it. So what we're referring to there in that V is the net velocity between the particle and the fluid. Okay, so... We can estimate that CD, though, in several ways. There are several equations available to us, and they depend on where we are in the Reynolds number. The drag is related to the Reynolds number in the inverse way when we're at low Reynolds numbers. So 24 over Reynolds number or 24 over Reynolds number with some modification factor after it. So essentially, in this, re this region where Reynolds number is less than 1,000, Higher Reynolds numbers mean lower drags. So as you go to higher and higher 
more and more turbulent conditions, you get less and less drag. Remember that from physics? Okay. So there's that mathematical statement of that fact. Beyond a certain Reynolds number, you get constant drag. Drag doesn't change too much anymore beyond a certain turbulent level. And then if you really at high turbulence, that drops down a little bit, and, but it's also constant. So we can visualize that over those four regions by seeing that constant decrease. So there's the 24 divided by Reynolds number. It's roughly a straight line with that slope of 24. Then we get that sort of a bit of a curvature happening. That's that second region over there. So this is refers to that region. So as our Reynolds number goes up, we curve slightly. Then we get to that 0.44, and then we get that drop down to about 0.1. Okay. So that's the visual statement of those four equations. OK, so now we're ready to do our momentum balance. So sub in those, those, four, those three forces. Our momentum on the left over there is set to zero at steady state, and we can solve in, uh, sub in that the volume of the particle is given by that relationship. The projected area of the particle is given by that second equation over there, and we can solve for V, the terminal settling velocity. Terminal settling velocity is actually reached pretty quickly. Okay? So particles will initially be slower, and then they'll reach their terminal settling velocity and remain at that, but the time taken to reach that terminal settling velocity is relatively short. So we, we simply discount that sort of warm-up period, but it quickly reaches VTSV. Take a look at that equation and ask yourself if it makes sense. Um, just a question about the, uh, the VW in the drag force. Yeah. Is that a velocity of a particle relative to the bulk fluid or to like the fluid right next to it that it's displaced? To the bulk fluid. Let's take a look at, does this make sense? Higher terminal settling velocities are obtained with higher amounts of gravity. So if you were on a planet where G was higher, you get faster settling velocities. Make sense? Larger diameter particles settle faster than smaller diameter particles. But it's not linear. There's a quadratic here, right? A uh, square root here, I should say. So if you double the diameter of the particle, you don't get double the settling velocity. It's proportional to the square root of the diameter. Okay? Density difference. If you have a more dense particle, you get faster separation. So if you're settling in water and you take one solid with a higher density and a lower density, keeping the, the fluid density constant, you'll get faster terminal settling velocity. If you're settling sand in air, and sand versus water. So if you're dropping sand in air versus sand in water, which one's going to settle faster? Sand in air, because that difference in density is greater. So the greater the density difference, the faster the settling. If you have two materials, if you have a solid that's got very close density to the fluid that it's in, it's not going to settle very fast. Okay. So particles with a density that closely approximates the fluid, it doesn't matter what these other terms are. If this term is essentially zero, you're going to get no settling. That's the key of this whole principle of sedimentation. You're exploiting density differences. Okay. It doesn't matter if you're settling on the moon or Jupiter or in a high-speed centrifuge. If the delta P rho is zero, you're not going to get separation occurring. Okay. That's the key insight with sedimentation, is the density difference. So if you want to make your particles settle faster, what are you going to do to them? You're, you're settling particles in your company and your boss is like, this is taking way too long, speed it up for me, what are you going to change? You're going to change the fluid. What are you going to do to the fluid? Use a less dense fluid. So could you use a less dense fluid and you get faster separation? Okay. What happens? Can you change the viscosity of the fluid? 
Where does that have an effect? Where does viscosity show up in there? I don't see it in the equation. Through drag force, which is an effect of Reynolds number, okay? So this, that's, these equations are powerful from a process optimization point of view. We don't want to jump straight to designing our processes. We want to first look at this equation and see how we can use it to improve our existing system. Okay, and that equation tells us, tells us how to do that. Let's take a look now at the case when Reynolds number is less than one. We get a bit of a simplification occurring. I'll show that over here. If Reynolds number is less than one, we've got a very straightforward relationship for the drag coefficient. CD is 24 divided by the Reynolds number. And we can substitute that 24 divided by Reynolds number in there for CD. Do a bit of a cleanup on that equation, and I'll leave that to, to you to do. You can get you get a quadratic form and you can prove that that's the simplification. When Reynolds number is less than one, you can use that equation instead. Okay. So as long as you know that you're in, in very laminar, very uh, calm conditions, you can jump straight to using this equation to calculate the terminal <coughs> settling velocity. And this goes by the name of Stokes' law. Stokes was the person that figured that out. Now, there's a problem though. If Reynolds number is, is not less than one, there's a problem using this equation. And the problem is, to use this equation, we need to know CD, the drag coefficient. To calculate the drag coefficient, we need to know Reynolds number. To calculate Reynolds number, you need velocity. Okay, so you're now tied up in a circle over there. If you want to calculate the velocity, you need CD. CD needs the Reynolds number. Reynolds number is a function of the velocity. So we break that cycle by simply following the, this approach. Let's assume Reynolds number is less than one. Let's, that's a good assumption to start with. In other words, we're in Stokes's region. So if we're in Stokes's region, we can use his results that that is the terminal settling velocity. So quickly go calculate that velocity. We've got all the other information we need. Well, were we really in Stokes' region? We can quickly go check that. Go calculate the, the Reynolds number. We now have that V. We know the particle diameter. We know the fluid's properties. And verify whether Reynolds number actually was less than one. If it was, we're great. Okay, then we've got the, our terminal settling velocity and problem solved. But let's say Reynolds number was 2,000. What do you do next? If you calculated that velocity from Stokes' law, calculate the Reynolds number, you get a Reynolds of 2,000. Well, then you go back to this set of equations over here. And if Reynolds number was 2,000, you use CD in that entry over there, and you recalculate the velocity now using this equation, not Stokes' simplification. You use this full equation over here. So now we use CD with a new value in there, and recalculate our terminal settling velocity. Okay, and then you check your Reynolds number again, and then you check that, it's, that you were correct. Were you in the correct region? And you iterate a few times. Okay, so let's give that a go. Here's a chance for you to try that. Go ahead and try that example over there. Okay, now I do want you to follow a systematic procedure. Don't just jump in with the calculations. As tempting as it is to go use all those Stokes laws and quadratic forms, let's try to define our problem, explore, create a plan, and then you can go ahead and do it. So we actually won't even have time in today's class to go and do it. Let's just focus even on the first three points, and then
So define. Define step refers to stating what you know and what you don't know and what it is you'd like to do. So what is it that we'd like to do here? What is my aim with this question? Okay, to find V T S V. What is that terminal settling velocity? When we're defining our problem, we also not only write out our aim, we also write out what we know and what we don't know. What do we know here? Okay, we know DP. What else do we know? Density of density of the particle. Anything else we know? Density. Dens okay, we know density of the fluid. We're going to use a thousand because it's water. Okay, what's the viscosity of the water? Nope. This is something you have to know. As an engineer, it would be unacceptable if you didn't know the viscosity of water at room temperature. <laughs> if you know that the density is 1,000, viscosity is? OK. Very simple. If the density is 1,000, just flip it around, you get the viscosity. Okay? You have to remember that. It would be really, really terrible if you graduate from here and you don't know viscosity of water. Um, what else do we know or don't know? Okay. Explore. What are we going to use to calculate the terminal settling velocity? Explore the problem. What factors affect the terminal settling velocity? We've, we've just done that in the derivation prior to this. Okay? So the explore step is a little bit superfluous in this example, but there is one other thing that we want to do here in the explore step, and that's write out what we're assuming. What are we assuming in this system? The water is 20 degrees. We'll get to that in a second. We're, we're assuming that this is the only particle and it's not affected by anything else. Okay, that there's no walls around it that are affecting it, that there's no upward fluid velocity, that the particle is in a, in a static liquid environment. Okay, these are all the things that are in the back of your head but are not on paper. And when you're working as an engineer, it's fine to have them in the back of your head but it would not be fine if you're giving that piece of work over to one of your colleagues, maybe in another country, maybe in another division in your company. They don't see that. Okay? So stating what those assumptions are in the explore step, we're assuming that we're in an unhindered environment. So unhindered settling. We'll elaborate a little bit on that word later on, but essentially it means that this particle is not being disturbed by any walls or any other particles around it. So it's being unhindered. We're also assuming that there's no upward velocity. Okay, so the velocity of the fluid is zero. So when we're calculating that terminal settling velocity, that's the velocity of the particle itself. Now the plan is up here on the board for you. And I'd like you to go ahead and use that plan and we'll take a look at the example in class on Friday. It's going to take you five, 10 minutes to do that work. So I will not spend the first five, 10 minutes of the class on Friday doing it. I'm going to simply pick it up and review it. I'm hoping that you will be able to do it between now and Friday at home.